So thanks a lot for having me here, and thanks a lot for the nice introduction. So I could have named my talk also as Machine Learning for Code Generation 2. And I'm interested in actually doing that for the most complicated program I can imagine. And this most complicated program that I can imagine is how we use our hands to manipulate the world around us. And if you look back at the history of artificial intelligence, so we have learned that the, uh, the tasks that we associate intelligence with, like playing chess, like uh, answering all the questions of quiz shows, they are comparatively easy compared with the task of acting robustly in an open world, right? And, and this is, I think, for a very good reason, and this is what I want to talk to you about. And so let me start with a statement of, um, of Dan Wolpert, who is a neuroscientist. And, it's, and he is claiming that we have our brain not for thinking, not for feeling, but we only have it for moving. And uh, so, so what he says is, uh, we have our brain for uh, kind of for one reason and one reason only, and this is to generate adaptive, goal-directed movement. And uh, so that is uh, certainly kind of a very true statement because um, kind of movements are the only way we can actually change the world around us so that we can achieve our goals. So even if we talk, right, so, so we, we, uh, we move the muscles of our tongue and in order to communicate and make changes in the world. And if we are looking at the evolution of the brain and uh, kind of where the brain became particular large, right? So this is kind of when, when uh, kind of the species started to manipulate objects in goal-directed ways. And kind of that complexity of the brain is very closely related to the complexity of uh, the manipulation actions that we are uh, performing and uh, also the cognitive capabilities that are needed to, to generate more complex manipulation tasks uh, became kind of a lot more sophisticated at that point. So uh, um, in the evolution, so the, it's, it's uh, it kind of the, the uh, evolution of these uh, manipulation capa capabilities, they are concurrent with the uh, evolution of language and also with the uh, sophistication of internal representations in our brain with what's going on in the world. So what I'm interested in is, so I, I want to basically write a computer program that can generate manipulation actions at a human scale, for human scale manipulation tasks, and in a world that is as realistic as possible. And what I believe is, if we are able to design, to implement, and understand how such a program is working, this will give us kind of a huge uh, step forward in understanding what intelligence means and uh, how we could possibly realize it. In Bremen, we have just started uh, a collaborative research center with uh, a name Everyday Activity Science and Engineering, or ES in short. And uh, this is uh, basically what we are focusing on. research, we're now at a stage where our robots can perform complex manipulation tasks, but only in specific contexts, for specific objects, and under specific conditions. The transition should be to mastering human-scale manipulation tasks in realistic and open situations. 
If we want to go from current robots to mastering activity robotics, the key point is knowledge. The robot will only get key point task descriptions, such as drop something from the pot, and it will need to know that it means tilting the pot, that if it tilts it too much, it will spill, not too high, not too low, and that the weight in the pot will change. The question is, how to get the common sense and naive physics into robot control systems and make it effective so that it basically does its job without delaying the performance. The robot should not have to wait a long time until the reasoning problems are solved. The reasoning should be ubiquitous, so fast that you don't notice that it's there. So this is kind of what we are after in, in ease. And um, so, so basically, we want to understand everyday uh, manipulation tasks. We want to understand um, kind of what the structure of everyday manipulation task it is. And in particular, how the brain is able to do all the control decisions and uh, all the decision making that is necessary to perform these actions uh, competently and seemingly with, with kind of little uh, computation effort. At least if, if, we, if we look at the um, disastrous complexity and partially unsolvability of the problems in that general formulation, right, in, uh, as a computer scientist. And so what we believe is happening, so that everyday activities are tasks that are very complicated, right? If you look at the manipulation we do for setting the table or for preparing a meal, it's enormously difficult to, um, to, to program such programs. But at the same time, these tasks are common and mundane. And if you are looking at how people move, there is an enormous stereotypicality of a movement. So even if somebody starts moving, doing something, we already can recognize what the people are doing, right? And so we want to understand how that is. And what we think uh, kind of is the relationship between these characteristics is that the, re the, that the property of the task being common, that allows us to co collect an enormous amount of knowledge about how these tasks are uh, accomplished, and in particular, kind of uh, forming that uh, knowledge in a, uh, in a particular form that is immediately applicable to the activities we are doing, and this is what uh, makes the task mundane. So what we are doing in ease is we want to study how people are performing activities. And the coolest way we, we think on how to do that is uh, using virtual reality and game engines. And the reason that is the case is if you have a game engine with a physics engine underlying, you get ground truth data about everything. You get perfect knowledge about the world and uh, you have all the access to the physical events. And this allows you that your system that is uh, interpreting the data and the processes that run in the, in the physics engine of the, of the game engine, that they understand the activities that are, uh, that are taking place. So they can be automatically transformed into symbolic representations of activities uh, that are then uh, accessible uh, through our uh, knowledge system. So what we are doing is we are basically just taking our doctoral students and tell them to, do, to perform tasks like uh, set the table, clean the table, 
we record the data and we basically collect huge amounts of data to uh, learn about structures. And we want to push the environments to be, to, to be physically as realistic as possible, but also in the rendering as realistic as uh, possible. And so everything gets interpreted and, uh, and uh, transformed into knowledge automatically. And the reason, of course, is we want to basically take that knowledge and transfer it into robot control programs, right? So if you, if you look at the problem in relation to the first two talk, where we were talking about uh, machine learning. So I think the lessons we learned over the last years is, for one thing, that we have much more data uh, to learn from than we expected, right? And the other lesson we learned, we have machines and algorithms that can actually uh, process these data. And at the moment, that really pushes uh, kind of the, the tasks that, uh, that we are able to solve. And, uh, for, and the main reason from my perspective is that kind of having this huge amount of data so um, allows us to learn representations that are very well correlated with the problems that we are solving. And, and uh, so what, what was earlier the case is that we have to, had to come up with the features in, to, to solve problems beforehand and through analytical thinking, and we had to make abstractions, and the abstractions really didn't work well when we were learning for specific problems. Now, kind of the computing machine is so powerful that we can actually learn these representations by feeding it uh, with, uh, with uh, kind of just enormous amount of data. But also, as, as kind of we have uh, also seen in the first talk, what is missing in these systems is that these systems are not understanding what they are doing. They are only looking for correlations in, in data. And uh, this is actually, when you look at the Gartner curve, where basically deep learning will actually come to its limit, right? So if we come to learning problems where it's necessary that the learning system has some deeper understanding, of the problem, where we need uh, compositionality, and that we can uh, compose different solutions into better solutions, and we need to be cognizant about what the system is doing. So, so what we want to have is, essentially, if we look at human and, and somebody doing a manipulation action, we want to the, the robot to, to look at a YouTube video and see that and interpret what is happening and actually learn in two or three examples to, to perform the same detection. So the research challenge that I'm interested in, if you uh, remember the video on, on popcorn making, there were many manipulation tasks of the glass fetch in place with the same object in different constellations for different purposes. So what I want to do is I want to write one plan, one manipulation plan that can perform all these tasks in the respective context. I want that pro program to be written in a way that uh, kind of, but if the robot looks at a YouTube video and it has variations of the task, that it can basically learn from that, transfer it into its own code. So learning from very few examples. So the system should also work if I just replace the objects by other objects, if I make variations of tasks. So it should uh, generalize. And I think what is extremely important if we are looking at the system, that the system can answer all the questions about what it is doing, why it's doing it, what, what it expects to happen when it's doing, whether there are alternatives of doing, and uh, how, how basically the action might fail. Being cognizant in that way, I think, is extremely important for writing competent pro pro uh, programs and uh, robust programs. 
So let's look a little bit at the uh, evolution of mastery of manipulation action in, in humans. So this is kind of a kid not even two years old. And uh, it's uh, filling kind of a glass with water, right? And so, so I think what is amazing for me so is the amount of cognitive capabilities going on when that uh, little boy is actually performing that action, right? So the boy, even so, it, uh, he certainly has not the linguistic means of describing what's going on. It's, he's decomposing the actions into different uh, kind of sub actions like grasping the handle, keeping the pot upright. And um, the other amazing thing is he's also able to, to parameterize the action in uh, the effect space. So he's, he's performing the action in order to avoid spilling. He's using the cup for stabilizing the actions and so on. So the other thing is, so, so I guess our kids all learn kind of to perform uh, the manipulation action in that way. But if we go over the lifetime, we basically are able to, um, to learn lots of variations of pouring. And they hardly have anything to do with the original pouring action if you look at a behavior level. And uh, we can do that by observing, reading, playing, and ex exploring. So the hypothesis underlying our uh, research is that I believe we can design and, uh, and implement a control program that has the cognitive capabilities uh, of the two-year-olds. But we also can implement it in a way that this program can automatically learn and uh, modify itself, kind of uh, collect knowledge to get to learn all these kind of variations of manipulation action. And this is kind of what we are after in our research plan. So for me, kind of the essential component of, of such a system is something, a system like a Siri agent. A system where the robot can go and, and ask uh, always about any aspect of the activity that it's performing. And the most important question that a robot has to, um, has to ask is, how do I have to move my body to accomplish a certain underdetermined ta uh, task, like uh, fill a glass, such that it can, uh, I can achieve the desired effects and avoid the unwanted side effects. And so, the, so what we are believing is we can write plans which are fairly general and which can basically be parameterized by underdetermined action and object, object description. The system is always on the fly generating questions on of the class, how do I have to move my body? We have that general uh, answering system. And essentially, kind of the answer, you can always um, imagine as a, a parameterized motion specification that can be um, rendered in augmented reality. And if you move exactly as the rendered augmented reality, then uh, this is the way that the action is expected to be successful. Another component that is extremely important in that architecture is the way we collect experience and learn from it. So, so what we assume is whatever action we are doing, we are collecting um, what we call a narrative-enabled episodic memory from it, we uh, kind of put it in the knowledge base, generalize from that, and this is where the common sense and intuitive physics uh, knowledge comes from. So I want to basically, and so, so if you are looking at AI in the past, right? So, so um, one of the fundamental 
and I think very limiting assumption of artificial intelligence is that artificial intelligence always assumed that a kind of intelligence starts at a certain level of abstraction. And that level of abstraction is essentially a state transition uh, system where basically the transitions between these states um, are atomic. And if you look at the representations of the in artificial intelligence, you have these state, state and transitions to be actions like pick up or close. So what that means is, so you in, in artificial intelligence systems, you have um, models of these actions, but you have no mean of uh, kind of going inside and make the movements so that the action actually succeeds, right? And this is, if you are looking at robots and you have a task like flipping a pancake, it's all about the movement that you have to do, right? So that you don't destroy the pancake, that the pancake is actually flipped to the other side and so on. So, so, um, so I think it's, it's extremely important that AI goes inside into the system at the image level, at the motion level, in order to have its full impact. And I also think that this is now the time to do that because we now have very different computation tools like deep learning, game technologies, big data management, and now we can do that. Okay, so let's first look at the left part and the generalized plans and how they look. So, so kind of what we are trying is, we wanna write one plan for an action like pour and one uh, kind of an action like fetch. And this general plan should be able to produce all variations of behavior that are possible, um, or that are necessary to do all variations of pouring or fetching. The way we are doing it, that, that uh, kind of the key um, data structures in our system are partial object and action descriptions. So what's happening, we are going, we have a, a plan f like fetch any object from any place in order to uh, do anything with it, right? And uh, so, and, and we always get partial descriptions like fill a class. And so what's happening is that we basically have to um, infer the motion parameterizations that are necessary and basically fill, fill it in in that general movement pattern that we can define for each plan. And the way these movement uh, patterns uh, and plans uh, are structured, so this is, uh, for instance, um, proposed in work by, from Cognitive Psychology of Action by Flanagan and Bowman. So the idea is that actions are composed from action phases, and uh, that action phases have uh, motion phase goals. And what is important that each of these motion phases also has knowledge precondition. If I do a reaching action, I have to decide on uh, kind of where I reach, right? Which should be my pre-grasp, which should be my grasp in order to pick up the object. And, and what the system has to do is it has to satisfy the knowledge preconditions to make the actions executable. So a typical task is like uh, pour the water out of the pot, right? And uh, kind of a system has to infer the, infer the motion parameters and constraints like uh, grasp the pot by the handle, hold the pot horizontally, tilt the pot around the axis between the handles, hold the lid while pouring. If the system, if the robot is not inferring these kind of motion constraints, the action cannot be successful. And this is kind of the, the common sense knowledge and the intuitive physics knowledge that is deep inside ourselves and that we are not aware of. And, and if we wanna have 
robust, intelligent computer system, this is kind of the knowledge that we need. So the key question is always, how do I have to move my body in order to, give, uh, to accomplish a given task in the current task context on the available objects in this situational context that I'm currently seeing with the uh, camera of my robot? And the answer should always be a rendered motion that the robot can execute. So let me just give you one example. So, so in our robot control programs, we have, can have partial descriptions like a location on the countertop, um, a, a, an object which is a container which is on the countertop, and we have a picking up action. So pick some uh, stuff of type pancake mix, which is in the container object. So the worst thing that can happen if we have these partial descriptions, that we are interpreting them as a distribution of instances uh, um, of, of these things. So here, this is uh, the knowledge representation, which is inside of our robot. It gets the instruction, uh, basically gets something on the table. It's sampling from these distribution. It tries to perceive and recognize the object. If not, it has to backtrack in the sample space. So this is very much like in the machine learning talk that we have seen. So it seems to be a very stupid idea. But what makes this, uh, this idea very powerful is with any failure that you get, with any success, you could get a new learning example of how these distributions should really look in order to produce successful actions, right? And you see, here you see the robot uh, kind of performing these actions, also doing the backtracking. And um, yeah. so we are coming back to that part later. Um, so this, so you have seen the robot actually backtracking in that space, right? So, so you don't want to do that, right? So you want to be your robot more, to be more intelligent. And the way you're getting that, and this is also what the brain does, is to get prospection into your system, right? So once you, you are able, with your questioning answering system, to answer the question, I just want to basically have the parameterization so that the action will be successful, then you don't need that whole backtracking, right? Because then you can do the backtracking in your mind. But for that, you need the essential capabilities of predicting what will happen if I basically execute my intended action. So I don't have to, the time to show the video here, but here we have a variation of the program where uh, basically that same task is done on projection. So I want to turn to the second topic, and this is how the knowledge representation inside a robot uh, should look. So from AI, and this is kind of a very powerful framework, we want to have kind of knowledge in an abstract way, as knowledge chunks which are modular, which are general, uh, generally applicable. So if we look at the picking up task, so we want to have rules in our knowledge base like if a container is filled and open, then you have to hold it upright. If an object can, can break, then you don't want to squeeze it too hard. If a task context is, is pouring, then you want to uh, grasp close to the center of mass because then the tilting is easier. Uh, you don't want to grasp the mouth of the bottle because then you would spill over the mouth and so on. And the power of these, uh, these knowledge chunks is that they apply to task instances that you have not seen before, right? So they are, they are really generalizing and they help you to scale towards an open environment. So you want to have that definitely in your knowledge base. But a robot is also 
different than a system like a Watson system. And, and the, the big difference is that the things that it reasons about are also the things that it's doing. And so in a way, if a robot doesn't have a knowledge base at all, but it's uh, performing a set of manipulation actions um, uh, successfully, then it must have the knowledge to perform these actions successfully, right? The only thing is that this knowledge is implicit by the, uh, by the programmer coded, hard-coded in some part of the program. So what you want to do if you, if, if you implement a knowledge base uh, for a robot control system, you want to make the knowledge that is implicit in your control program explicit so that the robot actually knows uh, about it. So, so, so if you have uh, uh, in, in your knowledge base an assertion like my current position is x, y, o, then the way to do that is that you take that predicate, you look up in, in your knowledge, in, in your control system, the, the estimate, the probabilistic uh, position estimate of your base filter, look that up and uh, put it up to the symbolic level. So you want basically that your whole robot control program, your whole uh, data structure there are actually a virtual knowledge base, right? The third idea is the question of how abstract should knowledge bases be. And so, so from our experience, we believe that if we want to produce motions, we need knowledge bases which are very detailed, which match the reality uh, very closely, and that game engine technology gives us the opportunity to build virtual twins of the real world in robot uh, control programs and to use these data structures as a knowledge base for robot control. And that's kind of a very, very powerful idea. So what we are doing is, so we are building up uh, an environment in a game engine. So when we build up the, the data structures of the game engine, for every data structure that is interesting for robot control, we give that data structure a symbolic name. We link it to the ontology of our robot control system, and we provide background knowledge for that. So that has the implication that anything you see in your game engine environment is actually knowledge in the knowledge base, right? There is nothing that is depicted in the game engine that you do not have knowledge about. Kind of very powerful idea. And uh, so we have, yeah, so, so just, so, we, so this is actually the knowledge base, the symbolic knowledge base of our robot. And it uh, basically, everything that you see here is accessible as a, a, a first order logical query. You see the queries here, and which basically describe the activities here. And you can semantically access the data depicted on the upper left by doing these logic questions on these, uh, on these data. And kind of, so that is, means that everything that is happening in the game engine, every activity uh, we automatically are able to decompose into motion phases and uh, basically get the uh, key post data out of this representation. So we are pushing the technology. So, so what we want is we want to develop robots that go out in the world and build actually knowledge bases in game engines. So, so we are starting to do that for supermarkets. So supermarkets are a lot easier, right? Because all the objects are visually distinctive and you have kind of a very 
nice structure with little overlap and everything should be seen, right? So but for that, we now have a kind of a robot system that goes through the supermarket. Essentially, uh, it, it knows about all the component objects of the supermarket and what it does, it tries to detect the object it knows of in the sensor data and tries to rebuild uh, kind of the, the model in the game engine. But the thing that it does, and which goes beyond what, what current mapping systems are doing, is that it, uh, if it sees a shelf body, uh, a, sh a shelf, uh, then it uh, attaches its shel uh, shelf to the shelf body. If it sees a product, it actually places the product on top of the shelf, right? So what that means is uh, when the robot actually is observing the world, it's uh, actually producing a model with uh, sufficient physics so that it's uh, actually operational. So you can essentially do that. Um, so this is kind of the knowledge base view. So, so this is because for those we don't have the models yet, but they are probably uh, recognized. You also see that it has some counting capabilities. You can ask uh, what is the place for certain objects, which of the objects are misplaced. And, uh, and what, what, what I really like is so that that model that is learned from the robot is also operational in a supermarket, right? So, 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 I, so one of the things I, I find very important about that is so that even so that is actually um, kind of basic research uh, kind of in, in robot control. If, if you see, if you go for these kinds of knowledge bases, these are, these are actually disruptive changes for technologies, right? So imagine you have robots that go through every supermarket that builds actually models of these supermarkets. Everybody has access to them, right? So that means uh, you can imagine whole retail information system to be built on that technology, right? And, and they are direct manipulation interface. You can do experiments in them. So everybody can basically look at every store and every part. Uh, and and uh, so this is kind of the power of some of the technologies that I believe are critical in the human brain for action control. OK. And the whole thing is wrapped so that we as AI researchers uh, basically uh, look at that as a first order logical representation. And all the, the continuous data, they are uh, um, basically below the surface level in Mongo database systems. And, uh, and this gives us the full access. And as we have heard before, we are providing that as an, an open knowledge service for the research community, uh, which is called Open East. Uh, yeah, Open East. And uh, you can take basically data from our robot experiments, run your own uh, programs and experiments on our data. You can even kind of produce data and extend our knowledge base. So we want that knowledge to be kind of a community good. And, uh, and we find it very important because we know what the values of, value of data is. And I think it's very important that uh, we, can, we, we have the critical data, the critical knowledge uh, accessible as a community and not that the big IT companies are basically uh, kind of collecting the data but keeping them on their own. So this will be, I think, very important for our all good uh, that we have this data. So I'm coming to the last part, and this is, I th think, the interesting part of where do we get the knowledge from. And 
unlike in many big data applications, the big thing about robotics is that the big data we are getting, they are produced by intentional activities. So we have access to the programs that are generating the data. And this is very important because the programs that are generating these data, we can uh, actually change them in a way that uh, the data that are produced are of high quality, of high information as possible. So we are doing that by forcing a concept that we call narrative enabled episodic memory. And the idea is that we collect uh, every activity of the robot essentially as a movie. <laughs> but at the same time, we make the robot talk to itself about every aspect of the activity and everything that is as stupid as, as possible. But we basically get a brain dump of the robot which is synchronized with the, uh, with the data here. And the big thing about that is if we are doing that, everything can be done as supervised learning problems, right? So we can basically take the data of what the robot wanted to, we get the data of what is happening, and we can learn from that. So if we are basically recording, uh, uh, displaying uh, an episodic memory uh, from our knowledge base, so this is how it looks here. So you see the continuous motions here, you see the, in, uh, the images that the robot captures, the internal data structure, the intention structure, and all the other information. And this is kind of what is available for learning. So this is very important because, as I said, so these episodic memories are written at any time the robot is executing a system. But if we have the episodic memory, we can ask questions like, well, I want to know about a task where the robot was performing an action of type pickup where the object acted on was a pot that had a certain weight, and that weight was more than two kilograms. So it's essentially kind of a pickup action of a heavy object. If we have that action, then we can ask, when did that action start? And what was the pose of the robot when it was uh, actually doing that, right? So, so it, it's kind of a semantic axis, uh, a semantic query, but we use it to basically get sub-symbolic data, which is extremely detailed. So this is <laughs> very big for uh, kind of machine learning. So, so what we want to do is we want to send the robot out. The robot is sampling in the motion uh, space to accomplish tasks successfully. We are recording everything as episodic memories. So we are doing that also in simulation, right? So we are giving it tasks, so the robot is streaming and doing the same kind. We do that many, many different times and we want to collect episodic memories for that. Then we have our task that we have here, but now we are actually using that query we had before in order to generate learning problems, because now we are asking for the set of all poses where we try to pick up a heavy object and the task outcome was success, and we collect that in poses. We can do the same thing if the action fails, and if we know all the sets, the examples where the action succeeded, where the action uh, failed, we can learn how do I have to parameterize the action in order to be successful. And the power of these episodic memories is, so we can use this episodic memory and we can play that game for any question the robot control system can, uh, has to ask during executing these actions, right? So, so this is then how things are learned. So we get the exams, we learn the places from which to pick up the object successfully, compile it into the program, and then at execution time, it's updating the place where it has to stand up uh, to pick up objects successfully.
Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, and we do that not only for the experience of the robot, but also for people performing the actions in, in the virtual reality. And not only for that, but also we have other sources of modality. So this is the experience of the robot. So we do the same kind of thing for reading. So if, if the robot reads instructions in the, in the web, so, what we are, uh, so, so we are basically inferring which plans do I have to execute with which parameters if I have a certain uh, instruction. We generate an action description that is uh, executable by our robot and um, we then execute it in the virtual environment and uh, we basically get our ep episodic memories uh, to learn from. So th that is actually then learning from reading, right, about actions. And we cannot only basically learn from reading, but we can also watch the YouTube videos where basically people actually show uh, uh, and demonstrate the manipulation action. So what we want to do is we want to basically estimate the activities of the robot in the YouTube videos. We want to replay them in our game engines in order to get the underlying physics. And we want to use that to actually learn general knowledge about how to execute manipulation action. And another part is important because if you are watching others to do, you, you kind of get most of the time successful examples. But to really understand the world, you have to fail. And that's kind of also what human dreaming is, is for. And uh, so, so basically doing that and uh, actually trying your action with different motion parameterization in your own physics world is another way to learn about the intuitive physics and how to carry out actions uh, successfully. So yes, so that's kind of the end of the journey where we are. So I think, I hope uh, that I could actually uh, show you a little bit about how exciting it is um, actually to, to try to understand the computation processes that underlie our manipulation capabilities. And you also see that if we are um, kind of pushing the manipulation capabilities, that also increases uh, the need for different mechanisms in cognitive capabilities. And in particular, I think the aspect of intelligence that we can learn of, uh, from doing that is exactly the common sense knowledge, the common sense reasoning, and the intuitive physics that is guiding our actions. And the reason that is important is, so this is knowledge that every human has, but it's, it's uh, so everybody knows it, nobody has to communicate it. So all these kinds of things you won't actually get by reading the web or reading other data sources that are in companies available, but you actually have to acquire them through experience. And we believe that uh, could be an interesting way of trying that. Okay, so thanks a lot for listening and uh, happy to answer questions. So thank you very much for your talk. Uh, other questions from the public? So, um, so you very much talked about, uh, you described how this knowledge base can, for example, be um, built up also by human actions where robots can learn from. And uh, I was wondering, how does the agent body come into this game? Because different bodies uh, very much constrain your actions. Yes. So this is, um, so we have, examples where we basically transfer from one uh, kind of robot to another one, but this is only kind of 
examples and we don't have a general story. So in, in, in general, the problem is really, I, I'm, I'm seeing something or I get the experience of another robot, so how does that apply to myself? For instance, if my vision system is not as good as the other one, so you will get kind of completely uh, kind of, yeah, you, you have to adjust and adapt. Um, so what is clear is that there is huge amount of knowledge you can transfer. <laughs> so for instance, um, you can transfer knowledge about the world where, where robots have found objects and something like that. And you can transfer, say, uh, manipulation skills from one robot of the same type to another one, right? But what, what you really need is you need a representational framework where you can describe the capabilities of robots, the kinematics of robots, and uh, so, the, so you can basically do that uh, transfer in a more systematic way. We haven't even looked, uh, started looking into, into that, so, so, but, but it's kind of clear that it's a very important problem here. Yes. yes, please. Yeah, I very uh, like the idea of making uh, the information that you collect uh, publicly available. And I was just wondering about if you really want to make it useful for someone else, then you have to make it searchable, right? In a way that you find the thing that you want to find. And you wanna, when you want to do that, then you have to like find a, 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 a common language standard, kind of a semi-formal language, to find the right task or whatever you're looking for. and. Yes. Is there already a, a, a standard approach or something? No, no. It's it's at the moment it's actually only a collection of tasks, right? Where we basically have the episodic memories uh, collected. It's it's in the beginning, and um, yes, but but I think this is essentially a problem. You we want to kind of tackle, right? But the first problem is actually getting some adopters and kind of hooking into the system. And so that is really, we hope that this is uh, becoming our problem, yes. So that would be, that would mean that we are successful, yeah. Hi. Um, you stressed the fact that how important it is that um, the robot also fails and learns from failure. So, uh, but what about cognitive senses that the robot can't experience, like um, pain, especially pain? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, c boiling water, it cannot actually touch it, or it shouldn't be touching it, but how can it know that? Because non, no human in a cooking show or whatever would ever touch it. Yes, so, so I think, um, yes, so, so, so in, in robots, we are always in a partially observable domain, right? And I think the, the way I would try to tackle that is to make the uh, game engine implementation more complete, right? So, so, so there you have things like artificial pain or something like that, and then you have to kind of match your own inner world model onto what, what is happening in the world and take that as a guidance. But this has to be very carefully engineered, so because this is really then uh, deciding on whether the, the robot is actually touching uh, kind of the first time when it's uh, the, the pot on the hot blade, right, that it's actually using the handles instead of grasping the hot parts of the, of the pot, yeah. So, thanks a lot. Uh, I think our time is up. Yes, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks. So uh, I will thank uh, our professor uh, Bates once again, and uh, now it's time for the coffee break. Thanks. So much.